This year we commemorate the 200th anniversary of the beginning of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ in this dispensation. Profound examples of strength to cope can be found in the early saints. In this program, Restoration Artifacts, you will see significant items that were used or made by saints nearly 200 years ago. But the real story here is in their devotion and strength and courage in the face of their uncertainty and challenges. In our time, we gain strength from theirs. The Prophet Joseph Smith was my third great-grandfather. Well, I'm the great, great, great granddaughter of Hiram. Hiram is my fourth great-grandfather. I do know that he and Joseph were very close, but the entire family was very close. They were a very religious family. The atmosphere around at that time was known as the Second Great Awakening. The different denominations of churches were competing with each other for members, each one claiming that they were the true church. No, another one, no, they were the true church. And it was quite confusing. But Joseph's family checked out the different denominations. One of the best known stories in church history is the story of Joseph Smith reading James 1.5. That would have been in his parents' Bible. In my hands, I have a Bible that belonged to Joseph Smith's older sister, Sophronia. She was two years older than the prophet Joseph. And it is fascinating to look and see the genealogies and what is written. It says, Sophronia Smith, my wife, daughter of Joseph and Lucy Smith, was born May 16th, 1803. And then if we turn the pages, we see Smith family genealogy that you will find in Sophronia Smith's 1826 family Bible that was printed in Saratoga Springs, New York. It is of interest to most people to see what the Bible looked like at the time of Joseph Smith when he read James 1.5. And here we can see, it's the, this is the King James Version of the Bible. And right there, verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So when Joseph was reading in the book of James, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That's why he went into the grove and prayed and had the marvelous experience there. Joseph Smith and his family was instrumental in restoring the gospel, but the gospel's for everyone. So it really is part of all of our heritage. It's, it's part of everybody. And so these, these artifacts are a good connection for myself and for anybody that is connected with the gospel that helps them realize uh, that we're all children of God and that, that we're all in this together. And our Heavenly Father loves us and He's, he's trying to teach us and, and show us the way of how to get back to Him. Christ is the head of the church. He is running things. He's in charge. I've had too many experiences to doubt it. The artifacts were handed down through John Smith and then to Hiram Fisher and then to Hiram Gibbs and then finally to my, my grandfather, Elder G. Smith. So it's been in the family for, for generations ever since uh, the original Smith family. These artifacts and the testimonies of others who have been there and witnessed these events, uh, it's important to uh, not just show the artifacts of Joseph Smith. It's important to show all the artifacts of all the people who lived in that uh, era and bring that to light so that historians can bring and, and put a fuller picture together. That will even widen the uh, history and realize that Joseph Smith uh, did what he said he did and lived what he said he lived and there, were, there was no deception. They had a, a strong work ethic. They also had the ethic of seeking the truth. They were honest people and they, they wanted to know the truth in every aspect. The box that Hiram actually got from Alvin after he passed away, Joseph was told by Angel Moroni that he needed to get a box with a good lock on it 
before he got the plates. So finally, when he gets the plates, he's coming home and realizes he has no place to put them. So about three miles from home, he decides he needs to find a place to hide them till he can arrange for a box. He carves out a log. It's kind of a rotted log, so he kind of pulled the bark off, carved it out, put the plates in there, and then covered it up, made it so it looked natural there. And then uh, he goes home, sends Don Carlos over to Hiram's house, says, hey, do you have a box I could borrow? And Hiram says, oh yes, I've, I've got this box. He was thinking of Alvin's box. Mr. Jelvis says, great. Um, he goes to get the plates and he comes back and Hiram's not there. Well, Hiram's uh, wife just had a baby days before and he was there with family that were visiting for the baby. And so Don Carlos goes over to his house to find him and he taps him on the shoulder, doesn't say a word, stands up, runs into the other room, dumps everything out of this box, sticks it on his shoulder and walks out the door without telling anybody. <laughs> he takes that box over and the box actually is just the right size that Joseph can put the plates into. I represent uh, the blood of the prophet Joseph Smith. I am somebody tangible. People who come up and shake my hands are saying the prophet Joseph Smith is real. Whenever they see me, uh, you cannot deny that Joseph Smith was real because proof is standing in front of you. Uh, the artifacts is proof that events happened because it's there. My father actually traveled down in South America a number of times and he went to a museum where he saw that they had these, these plates or sheets of gold that had inscriptions in them and they were as thin as tissue paper. They've also discovered other very strong plates down in that region from similar time frame that show that they actually did do uh, plates and they were very good at metallurgy and, and inscription and, and, and the art of, of working with metal that, that would have been needed to be able to do that kind of thing in those days. It's interesting, in Joseph's time, nobody knew about those kinds of things and yet now they're finding much evidence. My ancestors were first converted to the church very early on the first England mission in 1837. As I saw these early artifacts in my own family, I decided that I wanted to do this the rest of my life, tracking down these rare artifacts and treasures, each and every one of them having their own story. These stories bring history to life. We'd like to share with you this beautiful acorn press. This is what was used in Grandin Book and area for over 30 years to be able to share how the Book of Mormon was printed. So first, here on our table, you can actually see all of the different plates that made up the 16 pages, the first 16 pages of the book. Upon my right side here are actually the plates after they've been printed onto the sheet. So they'll put a sheet behind this duck bill that will go down on the plates and then they're able to print it. So I want to share with you what that process is like, because I think it's a little bit more involved than we give most people credit for. This is one letter placed within these plates. You can see how tiny the lettering is, and you would take each letter and make a space and a punctuation mark, and when you're doing it, it's upside down and backwards. So you can imagine for yourself the difficulty of what this would be to do it. Well, let's talk about how much more difficult it was when Joseph Smith comes to E.B. Grandin, and he brings this manuscript. This is a replica of what the printer's manuscript looks like. And you can see for yourself the individual writing. You can see that it's one complete sentence. It goes from beginning to end without any punctuation, without any capitalization in most cases, but one continuing sentence. And so if you were that typesetter, now you have to become the editor as well. Imagine what it would take to not only have to get each particular page ready, but to make sure that it makes sense. So what they would do is they would actually take a page and put it across this printing press. They would print the whole 16 pages. 
Then they would take and turn that paper over and they would turn it upside down backwards so they could print it again. When it was finished, they would cut that page in half and I'm going to show you that that's what this is. This is what's called a signature. So it's the 16, first 16 pages, front and back, because they've cut it in half. So if I laid it here, you can see how it would be two sheets. And then they will take the page and fold it until it makes the first 16 pages. They will repeat that procedure for 37 times to make the Book of Mormon. So the first edition copy of the Book of Mormon was printed, uh, came off the press March 26th, 1830. And has a very simple title page, the Book of Mormon printed in Palmyra, 1830. It shows Joseph Smith Jr. as the author and proprietor. Why? Because at that time period in New York, you could not get a copyright on a book that you translated. The Book of Mormon wasn't divided into our modern chapters and verses. That wouldn't happen until 1879, but this, this is what Samuel Smith took with him on that first mission. With no instructions, he filled up a knapsack full of copies of this Book of Mormon, first edition, filled them up, and then he went out that first day. He knocked on several doors, and every single person rejected his message. Nobody even let him in the door. At that evening, he goes into an inn to spend the night. When the innkeeper asked him what he was doing, he took that as a missionary opportunity and he pulled out a copy of the Book of Mormon and says, sir, I am sharing the message in this book that my brother translated from plates of gold that he found buried in the ground. Now this startled the innkeeper and he actually got irate with Samuel and he physically removed him from his inn and says, you will not stay in this inn with that book. What is Samuel gonna do? It's 10 o'clock at night. He begins walking down the road. He sees an apple tree. He's so tired from walking probably 25, 30 miles that day that he went and he spent the night under the apple tree using that knapsack for a pillow. Well, like most missionaries, good days, bad days. But that was the first day of the first missionary, rejected by everybody. And there have been two million missionaries since, but Samuel was the first. Everybody wants to know about a first edition because we know that Joseph Smith was so involved with the printing and handing out of the book. The question is, where was this book? And if this book could talk, this book would say, I spent the night under an apple tree. This copy is Samuel Smith's copy. Samuel H. Smith. Now that ownership book plate is from the time he was in Kirtland. This copy spent four generations in the Smith family before it left. Samuel referred to opening his book and showing people that he was one of the eight witnesses. And if we go to the very end, you will notice the placement of the witness page is right after you finish reading it. You have read it, and now these people say, we have seen the angel, we have seen the plates. These are the three witnesses. The eight witnesses are on the back, and this story was told so many times by Samuel, you can see his name is starred and underlined as if to say, I am Samuel H. Smith and I am one of the witnesses and my brother translated this book by the gift and power of God. We have some of the artifacts in our head in our family that were from that area. One of them was the bell. Because they lived on farms and there wasn't the communication systems that we had, Lucy had a bell that she would ring to call people in for meals. Joseph Sr. also taught school for a while, and he used it as a school bell. W.W. W. Phelps copy, Neil K. Whitney's copy, John Gilbert, who set the type, <laughs> Elijah Fordham, miraculously healed. We have all of the, these books played a role in converting these men and their families. Uh, w. W. Phelps 
had a dream in 1823 that the truth would come from the ground, that there would be something that would um, bring about truth that I think inwardly he was yearning for. And so when he heard about the, this book coming out, he was just 12 miles away. He made the journey to the E.B. Grandin bookshop and purchased his own copy of the Book of Mormon. Now, W.W. W. Felt was very involved in printing in the church, uh, printing uh, Messenger and Advocate. Uh, he was very useful, very helpful. And we know from internal notations on here that he used this book right here. He's doing some type of editorial marks uh, when they reprinted part of the Book of Mormon in Messenger and Advocate. But that, these are all stalwart figures in early church history. When Joseph Smith arrived with his wife Emma in Kirtland, one of the first things he did was to walk into a general store and walked up to a man and said, you've prayed me here, now what would you like? And that man, was Newell K. Whitney, and this is Newell K. Whitney's first edition copy of the Book of Mormon with his name, N. W. Whitney, right there. Another very helpful person, a man who allowed Joseph Smith to live with him, and he gave him material and financial support to help during this, the formative years of the Restoration. This gentleman who uh, had married into the uh, Catherine Smith family. And uh, he brought us a shawl and also all of the family history of Catherine, um, who is Joseph Smith's sister. So that was a, a huge valuable treasure, uh, particularly to have a, a shawl that uh, Mother Smith, we know, had around her shoulders to help keep her warm. The shawl, that uh, came with this um, is uh, the size of a, a good queen bed. And it's designed to uh, fit over a bed if, to add some additional warmth. It's totally made of wool. Uh, but she would also fold it up and wrap it around her. Uh, she would also fold it in a different way that when she's uh, sitting in uh, uh, the rocking chair that Hiram made for her, um, she would uh, put it on her uh, shoulders and drape it across her legs, probably even put her feet on her footstool. When we look through history, we're, we're looking through this keyhole. And Many times there's too many people who make assumptions of what happened in Joseph and Emma's life and, and the first family of the church through that keyhole. And many testimonies have uh, wavered and changed because of what they perceive. Well, technology and these artifacts have opened up that keyhole to wider veil. We're still looking through a keyhole, but it's a lot wider. And I've witnessed uh, as a result, um, many of people whose testimonies have wavered change because of the witness. They realize they were wrong. Um, and so we're sometimes uh, too quick to uh, judgment to realize that the events that were sometimes told in history didn't happen the way they are when in fact they did, and, and uh, these artifacts and the testimonies of others who have been there and witnessed these events. Section 25 of the Doctrine and Covenants is addressed to Emma Smith. She's known as the elect lady, and in there she is given the instructions to prepare the first hymn book for the church. Now the first hymn book, uh, I think when we envision hymn books, we are seeing notes and music and everything, but that was not what the first hymn book looked like.
This is the first hymn book. It fits right in the palm of my hand. And if you open it up, you can see that there are no notes. There are only the words for the hymns. And if we open it to the title page, we can see that it is a collection of sacred hymns for the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Now you may say, why not Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? That revelation is not for three more years. So when this is printed in Kirtland, Ohio, in 1835, it is the Church of the Latter-day Saints. This is one of the rarest printings of any church book. As few as 19 of these have survived. I th but if we go to the very end, for many people it is a favorite hymn, this is the Spirit of God, which was added after everything else was set. It's in even a different font. But this is the Spirit of God, which was sung at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. And it actually has six verses instead of four. Verses four and five are not in the current hymn book. This is written by W.W. Phelps. Parley P. Pratt and W.W. Phelps provided the majority of the hymns in the original hymn book, and there were only 90 hymns in the first hymn book. Shalom, I'm Daniel Rona from Jerusalem and Salt Lake City, kind of being part of two worlds at the same time. The reason the restoration is so significant is because there was an original establishment. And so the restoration and the artifacts that the pioneers brought along may in fact echo the very gathering of Israel one of the amazing parallels of the gathering of Israel in ancient times and in these latter days is the desire to have a temple society. The children of Israel on their trek through their wilderness in ancient times even traveled in a temple order. The 12 tribes were on the outside, the Levites were inside the stakes of Zion. The Latter-day Saints as they were preparing to gather to their promised land and initially built a temple even though it would only be temporary. That Nauvoo temple, of course, has been restored. It had the elements of the temple of latter days, an immersion font on the back of 12 oxen. As you go to Jerusalem, you'll see even echoes of that. One of the fascinating uh, artifacts of Nauvoo is that wonderful sunstone. When Chorazin, ancient New Testament town in Israel was uncovered, there was an almost identical sunstone. There have been some others found in Israel. Of course, restoration means it was once and it's being restored and the echoes are fascinating. During the life of Joseph Smith, there were five printings of the Book of Mormon. The first, as I've mentioned earlier, was in 1830 in Palmyra, New York. There were 5,000 copies printed, but as few as 500 have survived to this day. Seven years later, a second edition was printed, much smaller if you compare the two, much smaller. In fact, there will not be a larger edition of the Book of Mormon until 1888. So after 1830, all editions are small. This is the edition printed in 1837 in Kirtland, Ohio. It was printed by Oliver Cowdery and Company for Parley P. Pratt and Jay Goodson. There were only about 3,000 copies of this printed and maybe two to 300 copies have survived. Three years later, in Nauvoo, the third edition is printed. There were approximately a total of 5,000 copies of the third edition printed in Nauvoo. Now in 1841, 
the first Liverpool edition or first European edition. It's printed in Liverpool. Now in England, they've been binding books for centuries and they were much more skilled if you compare it to kind of the frontier bindings. But this is the copy. Uh, they made some very nice copies for the apostles. Uh, for the, we know that Emma Smith had one of these very nice copies. Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, Mary Pratt, Helen Mar Kimball are others that I've seen. But this is printed in 1841. 5,000 copies were paid for, but only about 4,000 copies were delivered. And finally, there was basically a reprinting of the third edition with a new title page, 1842 Nauvoo, but there were a little over 600 of this one printed. And so of the first five editions, this is by far the scarcest. You will see very few copies of this. A few dozen have survived. So there you have it. We have Palmyra 1830, Kirtland 1837, Nauvoo 1840, Liverpool 1841, Nauvoo 1842. Those are the five editions of the Book of Mormon printed during the life of Joseph Smith. One of the first items of the restoration was that the prophet Joseph Smith literally called Orson Hyde, one of the apostles, to be a part of the tools of the gathering of Israel. Orson Hyde made an arduous journey to the Holy Land that uh, had miracles uh, that preserved his life. On October 24th, 1841, just as he saw in a vision in the Promised Land, he in the Holy Land dedicated it for the gathering of the Jews. That prayer is full of prophecies that have been repeated from ancient prophets and of course, modern prophets. So in that sense, the dedication of Israel is part of a Latter-day Saint artifact of the restoration. There was not going to be a restoration without the restoration of the land of Israel and the gathering of the people of Israel in their ancient homeland. So even in present day, President Nelson has spoken of the restoration, the gathering of Israel, both physically and spiritually. It's one and the same. This is a fantastic early artifact of early church history. This is a hook rug which was made by the late Kimball for her husband, Heber C. Kimball, to commemorate the first missionary sermon preached in England. In June of 1837, Joseph Smith went up to Heber C. Kimball in the Kirtland Temple and said, Brother Heber, the Spirit of the Lord has whispered unto me that my servant Heber is to go to England and open the door of salvation to that nation. And this was overwhelming for Heber C. Kimball. He felt inadequate. In fact, he said, I'm a man of stammering tongue and few words, and you want me to go to the nation that is renowned for its poets and authors? And Joseph said, that's right. Heber C. Kimball was so excited. He went and preached the first missionary sermon in England, and several of the people were anxious to hear what he had to say because they recounted they had seen Heber C. Kimball in dreams before he arrived and they had tremendous success converting many of the people who were there. Now, he would have written home to his wife, Philate, to tell her about this. And it was at that point, according to family tradition in the Kimball family, that she then made him something that would, he would always remember preaching the first missionary sermon in England. She had an old potato sack, which was actually made out of hemp. And she went to her friends. Who were her friends? Phoebe Woodruff, Emma Smith, Mary Pratt, and others. She needed scraps of material, uh, of stockings and socks. She said, they can have holes in them. I'm going to cut them up. And what she did is she then took those little scraps and on that two foot by three foot piece of material, she put the material through and made an outline of Vauxhall Chapel. 
and then put her husband's initials, HCK, and on the other side, 1837. That is one of the first handicrafts in the church. If we take a look, you can see this is the hemp background. It would have been a potato sack type material. And then I've counted about 15 different colors, and these are all socks or stockings that were made. Foxhall Chapel was a very simple building, two stories, six windows, two doors, two chimneys. We see the initials HCK for Heber C. Kimball, 1837. That's when the first missionary sermon was preached in England. And this, um, according to the Kimball family tradition, was made by Vallette for her husband, Heber C. Kimball, and was one of the few items that they took with them when the saints were forced to leave Nauvoo in 1846. My ancestors were first converted to the church very early on the first England mission in 1837. And as I saw these early artifacts in my own family, I decided that I wanted to do this the rest of my life, tracking down these rare artifacts and treasures, each and every one of them having their own story. These stories bring history to life. With women, making quilts was a part of their lives. There wasn't a lot that could be done in the evening after the sunlight was gone and they were, were using candles or coal oil. But quilting was something that she could do for love as they would meet people that they knew. The women traded pieces of fabric to help the other person to remember me. Or maybe they had a dress that a child had worn out, a child that had passed away. And they would cut that into little pieces to give to other members of the family to remember that child with. And with little pieces, they were put to use. They weren't just thrown away like sometimes we do nowadays. But it was part of their heritage of keeping the family close. The fire doesn't stay lit, it dies down overnight, so it would get chilly. If they had a cabin, there was usually one bed in it. That was for the adults and the children slept on the floor. If the room was added, you know, all the children would sleep together. So they'd all bundle up and snuggle up underneath the quilts and keep warm. They made what they could. They were lined with different things depending on where they were. They might be an old blanket. It might be wool. The woman who made the quilt made it her. She would choose from what she had. It was an extension of her personality and how she stitched it. I was married in the Boston area and when I got married, the person that was in charge of quilts in the Relief Society would only let you quilt on a quilt if you could get at least five stitches on your needle, preferably eight. It took me a while, but I did it. <laughs> you notice this doesn't have any design to it. This is like a crazy quilt. It's because pieces were just stitched together, sewn randomly for whatever would fit in the space. They didn't always have patterns. The crazy quilt was quite common because it could just, you know, you used whatever kind of shape you had, you know, and didn't have to worry about it. Or they might make a design, you know, like the courthouse steps or the log cabin design. We have a lovely collection of quilts here at the Pioneer Museum. We have some really old ones here and we have some that are newer that were maybe made by pioneer women in their later years as a wedding gift, or maybe just because she had these scraps and she couldn't just throw them out, she had to do something with them, and so she made them. But we have quite a, an assortment of quilts that people can come and look at. It was prophesied that Joseph Smith would be known for good and evil all over the world, and he faced a tremendous amount of opposition almost immediately from the time he recounted the first vision to people. He was challenged and persecuted for his beliefs, and he faced numerous lawsuits, dozens and dozens. And on one of those occasions, he needed to post bail and the only thing that he had of value with him 
was a pocket watch. And I have it here. This is a pocket watch. It's quite heavy. It's a gold pocket watch. It had quite a bit of value. A pocket watch like this would have cost $25 to $30. So this is a gold plated pocket watch. Very nice for the time. With a value of $30, that lets you know that the average person, a day laborer, would have had to work about a month to afford this. In all likelihood, this would have been a gift to the prophet because he was rarely had an abundance of money. This, it's hard to see, but it's J.S. Jr., Joseph Smith Jr. And then on here, it also is J.S. Jr. But this is a watch, um, something that Joseph had to give up to post bail and he never had the funds to reacquire this watch. And so by the mid 1840s, this watch was gone and it it's taken a different um, trail over the years where it's been, but it left the Smith family probably by 1843. The Kirtland Temple was designed totally differently. They held meetings there, but it was there so that they could receive the keys that were needed to set the church up and get the other ordinances going. And the Nauvoo Temple was for the ordinances. For the Nauvoo Temple, they were also fighting against time, resources, opposition, everything they could to get up. This time, because the temple ordinances had been introduced, they wanted that temple so they could all get their ordinances but it was that important to them to get their temples. In 1835, the first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants was printed in Kirtland, Ohio. Nine years later, about six weeks after the martyrdom, the second edition of the Doctrine and Covenants was printed with a late edition. Uh, in the second edition, it's known as Section 111. That is now section 135 of the Doctrine and Covenants. This is penned by John Taylor, who was still recuperating from his wounds of being shot four times while next to the prophet Joseph Smith in Carthage. And this is the section that starts out, to seal the testimony of this book and the Book of Mormon, we close with the martyrdom of Joseph Smith the prophet and Hiram Smith the patriarch. They were shot at Carthage Jail on the 27th of June, 1844, about 5 o'clock p.m. by an armed mob painted black of from 150 to 200 persons. With the martyrdom, they felt it was important enough to delay the printing to add this section, which would become a permanent part of the Doctrine and Covenants. This photo was taken on March 24th, 1914. We, the undersigned, with joy and heartfelt gratitude to God, our Heavenly Father, hereby testify that we saw the Prophet Joseph Smith and declare unto all that he was a prophet of God. They each personally signed this piece of paper, so they were not only testifying to their children, but to their grandchildren and it was notarized on the 24th of March by F.G. Richmond. These 11 women knew Joseph when they lived in Nauvoo, and they testified of his true prophetic calling. And then he was killed, and they had to leave Nauvoo. They came across the plains, and they settled in Provo. This took place in Provo in 1914. One of the great parallels of the restoration and the, are the artifacts of the writings. The saints had their precious copies of the Book of Mormon, the first copies, Book of Commandments, the songbooks, 
reflect how the children of Israel brought their scrolls with them, how the tablets were given to them, how they wrote, how they had their history, how they wrote their genealogies and wrote their names. To this day, when you go to the remains of the last known temple in Jerusalem, you see these little bits of paper uh, stuffed into the cracks of the ruins of the ancient temple, the Western Wall. For the religious, they write names, names of people that are being prayed for. Is that just an accidental or an echo reflection in the restoration and the names that we pray for in the temples? My great, great, great grandfather was John Danes and his son was Joseph J. Danes. And Joseph was very talented. He was a great organist and a great composer. When he was seven years old, he was asked to play for Queen Victoria in England. And that was before he was baptized. I think it set the stage for his mind to be perfect in understanding music interpretation. Well, John was a pretty tough guy, and he was the father who came across the plains and 1862, but Joseph was a very gifted musician. So he played his little concertina on the way over across the plains, and oftentimes there would be a wagon that would call out, Joseph, will you come and play for us in our wagon? So he would play his concertina. That meant he didn't have to walk across the plains and came into the place that we call Temple Square now, where in 1862, they circled the wagons and Brigham Young would come and say, hello, I'm glad you're safe and I'm glad you're here. And Joseph J. was pumping the little organ and playing a church hymn. Brigham Young walked over and he heard the wonderful music coming. Very, very gifted boy on that organ. What can you do on a partial keyboard pump organ? Not a lot, but Brigham put his hands on this 11-year-old boy and said, Joseph, you will be the tabernacle organist. Now, I think what Joseph had was poetry in his fingers. He not only could play this little a short keyboard organ and make sounds that could come from it that had poetry in them to make of him sound beautiful, but then the tabernacle organ with a big amount of keys, pedals, sounds, he was able to read the poetry in his fingers. Richard L. Evans was a personal friend of mine. He is the one that thought up the idea of making as the do the theme song for the Tabernacle Choir. We are the oldest store in Utah. We are the oldest Steinway dealer west of New York. I think the problem we have today is that our young kids do this instead of this. So they don't have the power of creativity like Joseph J. had. 